Good evening. You. Hello. Thank you. Good evening. Um, welcome to Alta Call's presentation um, on dry eye. They've asked me to be along. Firstly, um, Oliver of Alta Call is going to say a few words and then we're going to kick off and uh, get this show on the road. Um, so over to you, Oliver. Thank you, Kea. And yes, evening, everyone. Welcome to our inaugural Alta Call Hub meeting. This is a CET approved dry eye webinar series. Uh, my name is Oliver Wooding and I am the group brand manager for Autocore. Firstly, I just want to wish everyone is keeping safe and well during the pandemic and this third lockdown. It's not been easy for everyone and I hope your businesses and practices are coping with it all. Autocore has been providing dry eye products to the UK market for over 13 years now. And I, I would admit we are a bit late to the party when it comes to offering extra education and training. COVID-19 has forced us all to change the way we work and it's kicked out of core into creating this new educational hub. Naturally, we felt dry eye, a dry eye update to optometrists was the first point of call. In the future, we hope to provide plenty more talks and network opportunities on topics and disease awareness uh, therapy areas relevant to you. Just a quick thank you to David, David Gilbert at Flame Health and Jane McNaughton at Clearview Training for their help and support in getting this first session off the ground. We have all learned a lot about how to do this virtually, as I'm sure you will have with caring for your patients. Don't forget this is part one of three and you will need to register for part two in a fortnight's time separately if you haven't already done so. You will be emailed regarding your CET points after. Lastly, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Kaya to this evening's session. He needs no introduction and we all look forward to his GIF overload presentation. I hope you all enjoy it and find it insightful. And back over to you, Kaya. Thanks, Oliver. So um, I'm actually not sure if you can see me or if you're just seeing slides. Oliver, are you seeing me or are you just seeing slides? I can no? see both. David? Okay, fantastic. So um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I want to try and make it informal. It's the evening, you know, we're going to learn. So what I'm going to suggest we do is um, questions as we go, really. If there's anything you really, you know, really burning about what I've spoken about, I would like to say, then drop it in the questions box. Don't drop it in the chat box um, because it will probably get ignored. And then either David, uh, Oliver or myself will we'll be scanning through that. We'll be able to answer questions. And, you know, let's just try and make it fun. It's a, a lot of this is good entry level stuff. And if we make it fun, we make it entertaining. Hopefully we'll all, we'll get, all get something interesting out of it. So like Oliver said, this is part one. Um, we have part two in two weeks and then part three, uh, two weeks after that. So, all right, so that's the first technical. My mouse doesn't want to work. So there we go. Um, this alcohol, alcohol range of uh, products. I'd like to thank Alcohol for asking me to do this. Um, a full suite of dry eye products and some macular products in there as well. Um, long history, quality products. Thank you. Um, and we just fly through that. So just, um, again, this is just part one, just a running slide. Um, and what I've done is I've broken down the lecture series into three. Part one and part two is going to be really taking you from the basics stepping you into dry eye, uh, some of the theories behind it and some of the early management. And then we will um, go into some of the more clinical management and some of the more um, serious stuff, uh, really some of the more uh, high-end technical type uh, treatment. So that's me, um, currently clinical director at Tomkins and Knight and Son. A uh, bit of a, a very path graduate of City Uni, a bit of time in her state, came back, got some letters, um, you know, started off 2020 really happy like everyone else, uh, ended up to under, uh, 2020 looking like that. <laughs> so what did I do? Um, I really worked on my social media, uh, really pushed my uh, optometry, Greek, just pushing images and sharing clinical stuff um, for people to enjoy. So if you want to check it out, feel free, uh, add me on Insta. Uh, on Twitter also. So just a little bit um, of basically uh, housekeeping. I've um, done a little bit of work for all of these guys, um, usually some lecturing, a bit of KOL work, 
and I'm currently on um, AOS's uh, medical advisory board, so no real conflict. And again, I'd just like to thank Alta Paul for inviting me to be here today um, to talk to you guys about dry eye and, and getting yourself set up off the bat. So we're going to go in with a poll um, just to make sure everyone awake. Uh, a bit early to say that, but um, I'm going to ask David to hit that first poll, please, David. And where do you work? Let me know a little bit about the audience. So a little bit of, um, I'm sure you can hear me over the poll. Um, there are six poll questions uh, within this presentation. And Jane McNaughton, who many of you will know, um, being a stickler for the rule, uh, which is excellent, means that if you want to get your CET, you need to hit the six poll questions. OK, so keep an eye out. Um, I am well aware there is a big game on uh, on the TV. So do, um, you know, do, do kind of pay a little bit of attention. Um, right, so there we go. There's the first set of results. And we have almost 60% um, independent uh, uh, opticians. Um, we have 1% students. Well done, you students. You know, could be, could be anywhere uh, rather than sitting here. Well, actually, you probably can't. So, well, even more uh, kudos to you guys. Um, a nice bunch in the uh, multiple, 24%, 10% hospital and then we have 12% uh, coming in as other. Following on, following that on very swiftly, because it, it has a lot of bearing on what you do and what you can do uh, with regards to management, not necessarily at this stage, uh, but going forward. Um, the next poll we're going to hit you with is, are you IP or are you in the process of um, getting IP? So I'm going to ask David just to run that one, please. Shouldn't I probably shouldn't need a long on this one, David? It is only a yes and no. Thanks, David. And OK, so 80% not IP or in the process of yet. 20% uh, IP, fantastic. And that actually really nicely leads me into the next poll. Notice how I've managed to get uh, the poll questions in as quick as possible. And we go there, if it will work. There we go. Are you considering IP? Again, it's a it's a, it's a pretty uh, quick answer, but hopefully, by the time we get through this series, especially after we do part two, um, for those of you who are not IP or that have not thought about it as an option, will seriously be thinking of taking it on. Um, personally, it's a game changer. If I could have people um, leave, you know, I, I started, having studied in the state, I, I really do think it how our students of today should be leaving university um, and but that's a whole that's a whole different uh, conversation whole topic uh, to be had there we go okay i'll take that almost 50 50 slightly more no but think about it it, it really is a practice changer really is so you will have all seen uh, this statement, okay? 2017, 
uh, TFOS Tube 2, the second variant of it. And, and you will have all read this statement, and I'm not going to sit here and read it to you guys. You, you've seen it, and there are probably people on this panel who are on the, in the audience who, who probably know it better than me. But the key factors uh, to this statement are it's a multifactorial disease. There's a loss of homeostasis. There has to be symptoms. There's tear film instability, hyperosmolarity, inflammation, damage, and neurosensory um, abnormalities. Now, I lean heavily on TFOS due to, and you're going to see a lot of um, a lot of structure in how I have based my clinic and how we do it at Tonkin's Mountain Sun. It's driven by is driven by TFOS due to. They've done all the work, and you've had world leading experts review the literature, put it together, and that they've really made it easy. Um, so um, take a look at it. There are there is an app. Um, there is the papers are available free online. You've got to put the effort in. You've, you've got to learn about it. It's not as simple as it sounds. Um, you've got to put the work in. So, you know, why dry eye? Who suffers dry eye? Okay. And really, everyone, you know, there isn't a demographic that isn't um, prone to dry eye. And what we are seeing now, particularly lockdown, increased screen work, increased tablets, more people stuck indoors, less outdoor time, is more and more people are being affected um, by the symptoms and the signs um, of dry eye. So, you know why is it important to have an imp to have a good tear film? All right, forget about the term dry eye. Let's talk about tear film. Why is it important? So, in terms of clinical benefits, I mean, a big one is refraction, and that's what we do, right? That's that's what the general public think we do. The general public thinks predominantly, I would say, um, and correct me if you, if you think I'm wrong, that the general public would think we predominantly do refraction and contact lenses. And if you have a poor tear film, it will affect your refraction. The cataract surgeons will tell you that. They'll tell you if there's a poor tear film, if there is dry eye, um, there is more likelihood of refractive, um, what's the term they use? Surprise, uh, refractive surprise is the term they use. So if you want to have a good refraction, if you want to be good at what we're meant to be good at, really want to be paying attention to the tear film. How else is, is a good tear film going to affect us? So, you know, in terms of the tests that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, diagnostic testing is going to be perfected by um, dry eyes. I don't know if you can see my arrow on there. If you can, my house is just about there where that arrow is. And the reason I use this nice image is because I'm talking about uh, visual field. Poor tear film is going to affect visual field outcome. And then you've got uh, biometry, okay? Uh, things like topography will be affected by tear film because that's what they're measuring. They're measuring, they're reflecting off of the tear film rather than the cornea itself. If you get around to doing scleral topography, again, you, you need good reflecting surface. Without that, you're going to get poor data. Now, from a patient's point of view, what, what are their benefits? And the, and the big one I would suggest, and I may be wrong, but the big one I would suggest is patient comfort. Patients want to be comfortable. Everyone wants to be comfortable. Who wouldn't want to be comfortable? And, and dry eye can cause some significant discomfort to some patients. So that leads me into the next question. And I really want you to think about this. So I'm gonna give you, give you a good 30 seconds on this one. And just, just really have a good think about this and answer honestly. So I don't want the, I've seen the paper, I know where this answer is going. Really want you to think, and from your general day-to-day -day practice, really have a good think about this. and. Uh, going to ask David just to run that poll for me. How much do you think dry eye can affect quality of life?
is interesting and it's more interesting than I thought. I when I, before I really got into dry, I, I'll be honest, I was at the not at all somewhat stage. I didn't realise um, how how debilitating uh, dry eye could be. And to put that into context, so that you guys get an idea of how that works, um, there is something to measure quality of life, there's something called utility assessment. And it just quantifies um, patients' preferences. And the way they measure it is based on ones and zeros, and some smart guys uh, run, the, run the algorithm. What's really interesting for me, and, and what I found really interesting when I, when I was reading about this, is something called time to trade off. Okay, you can live X number of years with the disease and then die, or you can live fewer years without the disease and then die. Okay, so then when you look at it like that, and they're, they're, you know these that guys are able to pull things in to make it comparable. This um, article in ophthalmology in, in, in 2003, and I don't know how well you see that, but I've just highlighted it, that people with mild dry eye or even moderate dry eye are on par in terms of time to trade off with angina. So, you know, I'm, I'm not a cardiologist, but if someone says to me, oh, wow, angina, I'm thinking, that's not nice. My grandma had an angina. She didn't, you know, wasn't particularly a nice condition for her to have. But to think that people with dry eye, and we're not even talking severe dry eye, even mild, um, moderate dry eye patients uh, can be on a in in that much discomfort, um, which is comparable to angina, and they would rather knock a few years off um, their lifespan um, than than live with it any longer. What else is um, affected by um, tear film? So we're talking contact lenses, you know, another big part of what we do uh, within optometry, uh, optometry contact lens opticians um, within, within the profession. If you have a poor tear film, it is gonna affect the patient. And uh, Tonkin's right, and some we are big believers in making sure that the field is properly laid before we run on it. You know, no point putting the gold standard in contact lenses, whichever your preferred product might be, on a surface that isn't optimal because you could put the Rolls Royce of contact lenses onto someone's eyes. If their eye is not um, hospitable, they're gonna reject it. And, you know, if you've got that, you're gonna retain patience. And without boasting, but, you know, we have a we have a fantastic retention rate. Our, our patients don't often drop out um, because we make sure that we have a good surface um, to put lenses onto. Um, if you retain patients, you have happy patients. Happy patients is happy practitioners, and happy practitioners leads to a happy business. Okay, and it. Doesn't matter how what we went to university thinking. Uh, for those of you who are at university, you you will, you know, there is a heavy emphasis on on the clinical side of things. What you're going to find is when you get into uh, practice, um, whether you are a hospital optometrist, whether you are in a, a business owner, whether you, you work for someone, you know, finances are really important, and you know you have to pay the bills. And uh, how you pay the bill, like I said, it will, will, will vary, but you, you've just got to bear that in mind that there is finance uh, and money is at the bottom of everything. So like I said earlier, um, all of this info, oops, skip the slide. Like I said earlier, all of this information is available um, on uh, chiefofstudesreport.org. Uh, um, lovely app, uh, walk you through the different sections and we go from there. So. They have really nicely created an algorithm um, for diagnosis. Okay, so we know it's multifactorial. Um, we know the patient has to have symptoms, but how do you measure it and how do you justify it and how do you clarify it? So this is the their executive summary of how you would diagnose 
um, dry eye. And it's, it, it's a fantastic, straightforward uh, pathway into dry eye. And it, it's simple. It, it really is straightforward. So we'll go through the triaging questions, and I'm not going to read them out to you. You guys can, you guys can read these um, yourself. You, you don't need me to read them to you. But most of these questions we're doing anyway. I look at those questions and I think there is only one question on there that I might not routinely ask. And it's about um, mouth dryness and swollen glands. Everything else we are doing routinely. And so, you know, you're not doing anything there. You're not having really to learn anything there. You then um, jump into risk factors. Again, I think most of us would know this. I, I don't think there's anything new to learn there, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. And then we get into the diagnostic test. So the way it is recommended you do it, that uh, TFOS choose to recommend you do it, is you do a screening with a questionnaire, uh, and then you drop into your homeostatic markers, okay? And just made, I don't know why I made that bigger. So. You have two questionnaires. The two they recommend are the DEQ-5 and the OSTR. Both are freely available on the internet. Um, some manufacturers will hand them out to you in pads if you ask nicely. Um, there, there are some manufacturers who will, who will send them out to you. So, um, the one on the left, as you look at it, is the one we designed. Um, branding. You know, you have to brand. People have to know it's you. They want to see your name. Um, and personally, within um, the practice, we tend to prefer the OSDI. Um, it looks like it's more questions, but the DQ5 is, is actually more than five questions. It, it's a bit more complicated than it looks. The reason we like the OSDI5 is because it's got a nice section um, on reading and visual tasks. And those visual tasks are important because again what 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 does the general public think we do they think well it's, you know i'm going to go see care and we're going to try and you know clog me a set of specs but an important part we do is is refraction and there's some interesting information coming out now about how binocular vision can affect contact lens discomfort so if you are not refracted properly if your binocular vision is not in the uh, appropriate place people are going to present with symptoms that overlap dry eye symptoms. And we've had a couple of patients who have come in pretty adamant that they had dry eye, and they didn't really. I mean, we, we ran all the tests, and all they really had was a predominantly, usually accommodative issue. Um, and we've managed to get their expectations in the right place and uh, get them going um, and, and sort them out. And so it is important um, to have a look at when they're having their issues. If they are having issues predominantly when they are reading, you know, or working with a computer screen, you, you can't just assume that um, whoever saw them before did, uh, did, an, did an adequate job, in all honesty. So you look at the next set, you look at homeostasis markers, and you're thinking, well, this is going to get expensive, right? And I don't know if you guys are going to get sound. Here you go. So for those of you who are in my age bracket and uh, possibly a little bit longer, you can remember that um, Toys R Us advert um, with the giraffe. And there are lots of toys available. Um, we currently at TKS, um, use a K5, um, which is from uh, Oculus. Um, there's the Edra that's available. Topcon have um, the Miner. There, there are some fantastic tools available out there. And what do those fantastic tools let you do? They let you do lovely um, composite graphics like this, um, which are great for the patient and, and, and great to show you. But if you're going in at entry level, do you really need this, this level of, of, of tools? Because it's not cheap, you know. You, you're not going to go. Oh, right. Let's invest in a significant numbers of kits. But they are there. 
what I would suggest you do, particularly for the beginners, that the things you really want to think about are osmolarity, which are, which, are, which are tough to do without the appropriate instrumentation. You've got two pieces of kit here. You've got the iPen on the left, uh, which is like a single-use device, and then you've got TierLab on the right. Now, that comes with a different chips. They have different costing. The biggest thing you want to remember between iPen and TierLab is that the results are not comparable. You can't uh, take a measurement on TierLab and compare it to a measurement with iPen because they work in different ways. So you just want to bear that in mind. Um, so there, that's a definitely something I would recommend uh, that you guys think about, either or. And then in Flamadry, which measures MMP9, uh, and Brian's going to make fun of me in a minute because I, I, can, I, can, I never get it right, it's, uh, matrix metalloprase 9, which is a protein marker for inflammation, the only way that I know of at the moment, if anyone knows, feel free to throw it in the chat that you can measure that at the moment is with an uh, inflammatory. And it's basically like a pregnancy kit. You take a sample, you put a testing solution on it, you wait, you get a result. And we've been using it a while, long enough that we, we were able to create our own scale, um, just so that as we as practitioners within the practice, um, if we were looking at patients, uh, co-managing patients, we would know where they were rather than positive, negative, which doesn't, doesn't well, give you enough data, but in terms of management can, can have a bearing. What I forgot to say about the osmolarity, it measures how salty the tears are. Sorry, but I, I just want to throw that in there um, because that will have a bearing on, again, on management. So you're thinking, okay, so we've ticked off osmolarity. Um, Non-invasive breakup time is would be great. You really need a piece of kit. But TFOS are really quite good. They said, look, you only need to do non-invasive if you're um, if you don't have um, if you know if it's available. If it's not available, don't worry about it. Okay. The reason TFOS is so good is because they even tell you the order in which to do things. Okay, so you want to do your nick part first, then your osmolarity, fluorescein, breakup time, um, same. So you're not ready to invest in some um, big, big pieces of big pieces of kit, but you can look at glands really quite simply. And this is a transilluminator. Um, I'm not, I can't, when I was at uni, I don't remember if I bought one. I got one when I went to the States. So I don't know if the um, uni guys are buying them, but it's, it's just a very bright pen torch, okay? And what you do is you take the pen torch, you roll it under the lower lid, and you can see gland, okay? So it might not be perfect, but it gives you an idea of what what glands what glands are going on there and and, and what uh, David question I can see a question but I can't see it in my questions bar so where is you top two there we go so someone someone very very cleverly uh, has said, yeah, placido discs. Um, placido discs are, are how a lot of topographers work anyway. You're just looking at the reflection of the wires. And you could do it manually. Um, I guess the only thing would be repeatability. Would it be any worse than using tourism? Probably not. Um, but it, 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 it's a good way of, of doing it. Shermer. The only people who really do Sherman now are ophthalmologists um, in rheumatology clinics. I would suggest, and I may be wrong, and I'm, I'm happy uh, for someone to correct me on this, is that Sherman's dated. Sherman is, is really dated because it, it just puts in, it adds in so much. It really messes um, messes up the tear film, and you know that you get reflex tearing. And you're you're not getting anything like a, a natural um, a natural position. 
uh, not a normal uh, tier film. And but Placido disc, yeah, um, if you have one, um, and if you've got a topography, you probably do have a Placido disc. There'll just be one sitting there. So thank you. And we have another question. Another question. Um, have to do with issues. So we have a question about contact lens uh, and keratoconus and uh, dryness issues. So I guess it depends what you're fitting them with. Um, a big one you might want to think about is what coating you are putting on the lenses. And we will actually, I will get round to that in, in the second um, lecture is uh, because contact lenses can be used to manage dry eye. Um, within the, uh, you'll see it in a moment. I've got a slide later where they've um, spoken about it, and where TFOS have mentioned contact lenses. It, it, it could just be surface coating. It, it it's hard to give you a generic uh, thing. Um, hypermellows, no, it's dated. Hypermellows is dated. It, it, you know, we don't use it. We there, there are so many nicer products of, as well out there. Carbomers, you just have to be a little bit careful um, because of that they can grease, grease the lens. Uh, sodium hyaluronate, yes, very much so. Tends to be what everything we're using now. Um, uh, tend, we, we tend to go with a sodium hyaluronate. Uh, Alcor has um, two concentrations, and, and as you as you know, and I'll get to it later. Um, the higher the concentration, the thicker the, the product. So. Um, I think that is it for now. I'm gonna just move on. So we've gone to Transilluminate. I hope that was okay for those questions. Uh, if not, you know, feel like, feel free to reach out to me outside of, um, of this. And that is, yeah, so that's the Transilluminator. Uh, so the question is, is that Transillumination with the lid um, exerted? Yeah, basically, um, if I can show you one minute, I'm in my wife's office. So I'm just going to steal something of hers and hope she doesn't watch this. So you basically you get the transilluminator, all right? You're going to or a torch. You're just going to put it under the lid and roll, okay? And you just shine the light up. It's like when you put a uh, torch on your finger and you can see the blood vessels. That that's essentially what you're doing. I, I mean that lower lid is not particularly thick um, and a bright enough light. Is going to is going to give you um, that idea, and, and and what you can see there. I don't know if you can see my mouse point. Uh, I don't think you can. Um, but what you can see there, um, those stripes that look a bit like um, tiger stripes, are, are the glands um, within the lid. For those of you who have OCT, what you can do is off label. Okay, so this um, is, is 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 an OCT that we have. A lot of the stuff I talk about, I might as well just say, is stuff that we have in practice is because it's things I have experience with, okay? And because I have experience with it, it's easier for me to talk about it, it's easier for me to on, answer questions on it. So I apologize if anyone feels that I'm heavily biased towards one manufacturer, it's not the case, I, I use the toys we have. And this is, this like with this OCT, what we do is we use the anterior seg module and you're just looking at the infrared image. So the best way to look at meibomium gland is infrared, all right? So if you have something that will give you an infrared image, you can uh, take really good images of the meibomium gland to give you an idea of where you are, okay? Uh, trust it, Doe um, put a video up, and I tried finding it, I couldn't find it, and I should have chased him down, um, where he basically shows you how to make one uh, with something off of Amazon. Uh, it's a bit like MacGyver. And um, it, you know, it's the, the tools are out there. Mm, you know, some of this kit is, is is expensive. It is expensive. Now, this everyone should have. All right, forget the fact that it's a digital slit lamp. Okay, but slit lamp, and that is the key to your what you do and how you manage it. And most of what the data you're going to want to collect, you'll be able to collect uh, with your slit lamp. So there you go. That's a nice image of um, the tear prism. And there you go, you just measure it, okay? It's not hard, that, that gives you 
uh, one of the diagnostics, if you remember the um, chart, you can figure out how high the tear prism is. And from there, um, determine how aqueous deficient they may be if they are aqueous deficient. Bubbles, you know, the ponification of the tears, um, record keeping, it, it's record keeping really, you know, blepharitis, you can manage it, you can see it. This is all done with the slit lamp. I'm not spending, wasting time on this with you guys because you should know, it. even the students should be down with this stuff. This is an interesting one. While you're at the slit lamp, what you really want to be doing is also looking how stretchy the skin is, okay? And it was an excuse for me to throw in this kind of weird but kind of funny um, gift. Um, there, you know, there, there's more and more information, and I had to look this up, and this was something that we tended to notice ourselves, speaking to some of our colleagues, speaking to some of our ophthalmology friends, is that if people have loose lids, it seems to affect um, their dry eye symptoms. So we've had a couple of patients when things have not looked bad, but they're complaining. I, I, have, a, I have a patient who is a, a uh, professional umpire, referee uh, type thing, and he just kept complaining of watering. It's like they're just watering, they're always dry, it doesn't matter what I do. And what we ended up doing with him in the end was um, sending him for lid surgery. Uh, this guy used to be a professional athlete, Save I really don't want cosmetic surgery, people are gonna make fun of me. Um, and we're like, we've done everything. This is what you need. He went and done it. He's happy, happy now. Uh, he's doing really well. So pay attention to these things. You know, have a good little pull. You know, while you're reverting lids, you get an idea of how loose someone's lid can be. Um, and I just highlighted uh, the main finding of that study, which was um, if you look at dry eye and lid laxity. Um, Lower lid laxity is significantly associated with ocular OSDI. Oh, okay, um, so OSDI was the one that they liked, which was great. That is just looking at how greasy the tear film is, and all we've done is just focus on the tear film, pulled back, use the use the small light source, um, and you can see that that doesn't need anything fancy to do that. I'm just running the video again. And you can see that with the blink, you're also going to want to be looking at how the patient blinks. You know, do they have an incomplete blink? Are they, you know, do they, do they, you know, if you're telling them to relax, but they're just not blinking, you want to pay attention to these things because these are all going to be things that you're going to want to address. Uh, and again, just another uh, example of watching the tear film. Okay, and you can just see there as I, you know, just pull it into focus, you can just see the debris and the greasiness of those tears. So you've done that, um, you want to see what's coming out, right? You, you really want to see what's coming out. And you haven't even, um, you know, at this stage, I'm probably, the, the only reason I've used this video is because I didn't have one with me using my thumb. At this stage, I'm probably going to be using my thumb just to get an idea of what grading uh, of my bone is coming out. You know, is it coming out uh, olive oil-esque? or is it coming out like toothpaste? And we've all seen those videos. I saw a fantastic one. I think it was by Sarah Ferrant, and it literally just came up like a, like a, like a rocket. Uh, it was pretty impressive if you like that kind of stuff. Then to, to further improve your diagnostics, you're gonna go into um, the diagnostic guide, okay? And I'm hoping everyone is using furosine and I'm hoping that people are getting back onto using um, listening green. So fluorescein staining. So you want to count how many spots there are um, on the conjunctiva and on the cornea. And the slide itself, you know, tells you what you're looking at to get this definitive diagnosis of um, dry eye disease. You can also check the tear prism height. Um, once the fluorescein's in, if you're struggling. So that was just um, using uh, that there. So that leads me to the next poll. So there's a keyword poll uh, for those of you who um, have switched over to the football. And who is using lysamine green in practice at the moment?
So the reason I asked this is because there was a big hoo-ha about not being able to use this in green and the way it stood and and on what the EU thought and what MRHA thought and what the GOC thought and then what the AOP said and then what the college advised and it, you know it, it got to, it got to a really weird point where people were not using this in green. From what I had heard. And, and this is this, this is you know Optom talking at top talking at a bar. That there's never really been a major adverse effect to listening green noted. Um, you guys all need to get some listening green. Okay, if you want to do dry eye, if you want to do it properly, you need listening green. Okay, um, and you can do listening green because listening green. This was a recent article earlier, um, well six months ago now. Time's flown, and we go to the summary and just highlighted it there. Uh, there we go. What does it say? Who have previously been hesitant or reluctant to use it should now feel confident uh, using it with the GOC's backing and renewed understanding of its application. You can use it and you should be using it. If you want a dry eye clinic, you've got to use Listening Green. If you're not using Listening Green, you are going to really struggle um, to see some of the other staining. So, you know, a bit of basic science, um, or basic optometry science, I would say, uh, fluorescein um, causes damaged cells to stain. Um, lysamine green causes dead cells to stain. Okay. And lysamine green will stain things that sodium fluorescein will not. It's not a big investment. And if you really don't like your patient and you spill a lot of it on them, they will have a bit of a stain on them. But I didn't say that. But um, it um, is a lot better than Rose Bengal. Rose Bengal were all, that was fun. Quick uh, question that has just come through um, fluorescein strips or minims? I would go with the fluorescein strip. Um, the reason I had the minims on there is because I got lazy when I was uh, creating the slide, so I apologize. Uh, I tend to go with strips. It's easier to control how much you put in. The key to when you're doing the staining is that you actually don't want a lot of fluorescein, but you want more lysamine green. And when I do it, I hit them both at the same time. I'm not stepping away to come back, to step away, to come back. Fluorescein goes in, lysamine green goes in at the same time. Using the different filters, they can both be on the same eye. They can both be on the same eye, obviously the same eye. They can both be on the eye at the same time to give you a good image. So go with strips, it's easier. Another question about the filter. There is a reddish filter you can use with Listamine Green. I don't, um, mainly because I can't remember where mine has gone. It's somewhere in the practice. Um, Listening green stands out. It, it, it's pretty obvious uh, when it stands out. But if you want that little bit of enhancement, uh, there is a red filter. A couple of the contact lens manufacturers do um, dish them out in combos. Um, where I've seen them, where you get the rattan um, and the and the red side by side, you, you can get them. Chase your your contact lens, uh, whoever the preferred contact lens supplier is. Um, you know, conjunctival drying, you know, you want to invert the lid and lid wiper epitheliopathy is a big one. And, and it, it basically is just showing that friction state of the lid as it moves over the eye. Okay. And it shouldn't look like that. If it looks like that, it needs to be dealt with. And, and, and again, we get into that in um, the second lecture is, is how to deal with it. But you, you need to know it's there. If you don't know it's there, you're not going to know how to manage it, and you won't be able to do that uh, with fluorescein. So, another question before I go into the last part is how long does it take for listening green dye to wear off? Um, not long. It's, if you get it on the skin, it will come off with um, lid hygiene wipes. Uh, we, we just do that. I mean, these guys. I'm not often going to be putting contact lenses in, so it doesn't really matter. When it's on the eye, after a couple of minutes, it, they, they don't look outrageous. It's not like they're 
uh, looking like they've, um, you know, been to a Halloween party or any or anything like that. So we've got another question. I'm not sure it's from. It says, uh, although I use listening green, you can see conjunctival staining lid wiper with fluorescein usually for those with no access to listening green. I struggle. I mean, you're right. You can see it. But it, it's not the same. I, I think listening green just gives you a better quality of image. It gives you a better grading, particularly with lid wiper. Um, I, I struggle with um, um, fluorescein on the lid. Um, maybe maybe it's me, and, and, and technically I'm, I'm not doing it right. But when you see it with the listening green, boom! It's that it is there. You know, you 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 you, you see it. it. It's very obvious with the listening green. Uh, the lid wiper without fluid. You can, you, you don't have to fully avert that. That's true. Um, for the for the person who's asked asked that question, you can just kind of roll it a little bit. And sometimes you need to for people who are not very good with aversion. Um, you can kind of roll it back. But if they've got very, something very subtle, then you're you're gonna you're gonna struggle um, to see it uh, without a proper aversion. But you can. It's just that you know that weird push that you do push and roll um, just to try and get those uh, lashes just uh, rolled back a little bit because you're just looking along basically the long marks is lining you're just looking at the thickness of it and the width of it so you've done your staining you you've got there now you you can classify um, your patient and you can put them on evaporative and aqueous and you know there used to be a time where you were evaporative or aqueous and now we know you're pretty much both um, it's just Whereabouts on that seesaw are you, um, and, and where and where do you sit? So again, TFOS, lovely guys at TFOS um, created this management and therapy report, and they broke down um, what you should be doing in terms of um, management uh, protocols. So what I did was I created uh, this little slide here, um, and it just breaks it up into stages, and. You work your way through the stages and the higher you get up. And then what I did was I thought, well, actually, looking at this, let's see who can do what. So at this level, at all levels, I would suggest at all levels of optometry, you can do most of that dry eye management. All right. So if you then want to be an expert, if you want to be leading the field, you want to be that place people go to you've, you've got to be able to offer something more and so ip gives you most of what um, management tfos used to recommend um, and you can do that uh with, within the within the practice um and you go with your comfort level i am not yet quite comfortable with all secreta goals um just because i've not had enough experience with it so I, that's probably my personal line in the sand um but why would i not do a long-term steroid if i was if i was mentioning it if i was and it was working uh properly um amniotic membranes are, are becoming accessible um it's not easy but they are becoming accessible so at the base of that tier at the prism at the you know at the, at the real base and the, at the foundations of everything is education all right you have to educate your patients and um that one there and really you know this is this is it you know if, if you can explain it to someone like they're five you know then you're gonna you're gonna be able to explain it to me and it's gonna make it easier big words great but it's one and it's been shown and multiple studies have shown this that if you can educate a patient about interventions and self-management um that you can get you will get significant clinical benefits but the patient has to be on board okay now how do you educate them all right you've taken the images you've shown them what what is going on right then the next thing the next big thing and, and this is really key is getting their expectations in the right place okay if their ex expectations are in the wrong place um they're looking there's a higher chance of them failing so if you get their expectation in the right place uh, you're going to do well and you really have to be aware that this 
takes time. Okay, this is not going to happen. Um, this is this is not going to happen overnight. We we we've invested in some significant amount of kit and and in even some management kit, and nothing that we have fixes it just like that. It makes it better, but nothing that we have fixes it uh, just like that. So time, okay. And interestingly, for me, there was just uh, this uh, article that was just published. Um, um, that's weird. They were just uh, pre-published. Um, it's not even out on, on on print yet. And I cheated. I read through it and then I, I went to the answers. But if you look at what they're saying, is that it takes at least 30 days for their OSDI to get better. Okay. 60 days for their lid wiper to improve, you know, 120 days for the fluorescein and lysamine green score to change. And all they were doing was using artificial tears four times a day. That, that's what they did in this study. And so you've really got to get it across to your patient. It's like, if you don't do the homework, you are not going to get improvement. It doesn't matter what you, doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter what you buy, it doesn't matter what you invest. You, you've got it, if you, you have to be in it fully. And I, I was really surprised by this, in all honesty. Uh, you know, tear drops four times a day, that was it. So what you, what you will also be doing, you'll be continually learning. So we looked at this now, and we, we spoke to the team, and we went, right, so what does this mean for us? Well, this means for us that we need to be telling our patients um, with, uh, who are presenting with dry eye is you have to be using it four times a day. And you, it is going to take three to four months for you to really notice um, long-term ongoing um, benefits. So you've got to persist, and if you don't persist, you are unfortunately uh, at high, uh, higher risk of failing. So beyond, you know, giving them stuff, it's it, it's the basics, right? You've got to educate them about hydration, all right? What we're seeing now, people sitting in front of their computer screen. You guys have been sitting here for about an hour now. I want to say coming up coming up to an hour. You know, how many people have had a drink? You know, how many people have got up and gone to the loo? You know, thank you if you haven't. But, you know, or, you know, flicking, people are doing that now with their working from home. They're not walking over to the uh, kitchen to have a chat and they're not taking breaks. So they're getting dehydrated. And these are the kind of things that you, you need to educate your patient about. It's beyond the eyes. It's, it's more about the whole body. And if you can talk about other things that dehydration leads to, um, then you can help persuade them, give them a bit of a nudge um, into uh, taking, um, drinking a bit more water. Um, and I think it, it, it's about two liters a day uh, is a recommended amount, um, not including anything you do if you are exercising. All right, and what's good for you and what's not good for you? All right, you need to say it's coffee. Um, you know, you shouldn't really be boozing um, at uh, early in the early in the day, but uh, from what I hear about homeschooling, you know, people are at it. Um, but it will dehydrate you; it will dry you out. I was surprised about milk. I'll be honest; I didn't think milk was would dehydrate you, but it, it's not good for hydration. Water is obviously the best. Fruit juice is good, but then you have to be just be a bit wary of things like sugar content for your patients that may be diabetic. Um, just just got to keep a check on that. Um, the other one we talk about, the other one that is um, really big is, is nutrition, okay? Um, and you want about four to one omega-3, uh, omega-6, omega-3 ratio. And so you need to talk to your patients about diet. You need to talk to them about the oily fish, the fruit, the nuts, the good fat. And you need to be on board with that. And, and these, are, these are conversations you have to have. If they are not fish people, then push them towards the nuts. If they are really, you know, really bad, push them towards the supplements. There are many supplements out there now uh, by many manufacturers um, to help you, um, uh, help your patients get the, get the required um, nutritional uh, thing. Environment. Okay, this is huge, and I, I don't think many of us uh, would think about this, you know, but for those of us who are old enough to watch Friends and remember Friends, 
Um, you know, humidity, you know, again, you're sitting at home, you're sitting in front of your computer screen, the central heating's on, you've got it nice and toasty, you're in your, you know, your uh, pajamas uh, underneath and the work outfit on top of the Zoom. But a cup of water on the radiator just to try and increase the humidity will make a difference. You can buy USB uh, humidifiers. Weirdly enough, my wife got one. Again, I'm raiding her office. Um, can't find it. She got she got one in one of these box things that she subscribes to, um, and it's a USB um, oil candle burner. All right, you put water in it, so you've got a, a natural humidifier. Okay, medications. I'm hoping that we're all asking about medications, and and you need to know um, not just systemic medications. You also want to know about the topical stuff. Okay, so your glaucoma patients are going to be on. Um, medications with back, you know, if they're on preserved meds, you know, these are all going to have bearings on, on their symptoms and you may not necessarily be able to change what the patient is taking, but you might be able to advise them and speak with the managing um, physician about how potentially you can change what they're doing, preservative-free options, um, and just bearing that in mind. Things like, you know, people that pop antihistamines and they don't realise that um, it's going to dry their eyes out, just want to bear that in mind. Um, while doing it. So what can you do? You, you've got beyond, you, you've now educated them, right? Um, and you've shown them they've got the blepharitis, um, you know, uh, and these are products that you can use to manage the blepharitis, okay? And this is where the finance side comes in a little bit. You know, these are all products that you can then supply to your patients. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's turnaround. It, 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 it's good for the business. Uh, warm compresses, okay, uh, again, is a key factor in dry eye management, okay, and you have to really impress upon your patient how important it is um, to do warm compresses. You know, this is not going to work for your American football fans, you know, a quick splash is not going to do that, and, you know, that's not going to work either. Even the lady in the background is like, mm, not sure about this, okay. Do we know um, what my, how, what temperature we need my like 32 degrees. You are not getting a towel to 32 degrees or 45 odd degrees to stay there for the eight to 10 minutes that's required um, to soften to soften the myelin. It's not happening, okay? Get the patient to invest in a device that will get them there because it's in their best interest. So a couple of things, you know, there's these home devices. On the left, there's uh, something I've got from the state. Uh, on the right, there is um, something that I got in the UK, uh, two devices that are available um, to the patient. But, you know, the eye bag works. It's got um, the heated uh, mask works. It, it's got data behind it. Um, and greatly, you know, luckily enough, out of water by them. So that's really good. That's anti anti antibacterial. Uh, eye compress that they, they've just uh, released as a uh, lovely product. And then you've got to give them the instructions. And you, you may have to write things down. You, you've given them a lot. You've told them about nutrition. You've told them about lid hygiene. Some of this stuff you're going to need to write down. Okay, You're going to need to put it on paper for them. And seven to ten minutes, you need to go two weeks religiously. And that's what I say. They are the words I use. You have to be religious for two weeks. After that, if you drop back a little bit, then, you know, that that's fine, but you have to maintain it. This is a long, this is a marathon. This is not a sprint. This is not going to work if you just um, do it for two weeks or don't do it for two weeks. The number of people I've said to you, so you're going to need an eye bag. Oh, I've got one of those. Brian made me get one. Do you use it? No. Still in the box. Okay. So you, you, you have to impress upon them the, the importance of it. So artificial tears and so this is where it comes into hyaluronic acid so artificial tears are not a not new thing okay so i found this um in a paper and someone else has done all the hard work and this is from babylonian times okay so in babylonian times they were talking about dryness and having a beer using onion um applying it to the eyes you know you know some people like uh, old medicine, old wives' tales, um, what's the term? They use homeopathic meds. If you want to go and find a yellow frog and give it a go, 
you know, you could do that. Luckily, the, the manufacturers made life a lot easier for us. So it started off with um, saline-based um, isotonic, hypotonic, preserve, but they had preservatives. And, and what we know now is a preservative is, is an issue. Um, we then went into um, synthetic polymers, um, which gave us better retention time, stayed on the eyes longer. And now this real third generation is, is, is the hyaluronic acid that um, one of the, one of the um, members of the audience that mentioned earlier. Hyaluronic acid, I think it, I can't remember, it's something like 10,000 units of water to one. Okay, this is why I don't give science lectures because I never remember, but it really retains water. Okay, um, and then you've got lipid emulsion. Okay, so hyaluronic acid, everyone talks about it, everyone sings about it. And weirdly, it was until the 70s, it was just called goo. No one really knew what it was. Um, connective tissue. Um, and it's, but it, it's really good stuff. And what we know now is that depending on how thick it is, or well, the molecular weight of it, and the concentration of hyaluronic acid, you can make it thicker. All right, so you can have longer retention. So you've got point two, um, and uh, I'll support you some lovely point two products. Okay, they do um, preservative free uh, drop down in, and in the vial. Um, and then you've got point four. Also, I've not seen stronger than point four. So if anyone in the panel, um, in the panel, if anyone in the audience uh, can tell me anything stronger than point four that they might have seen. Uh, really interesting uh, to um, to know to know what you have uh, there. Um, again, another range of products that are there. But the artificial tears we now know is important. Okay, it helps stabilize tears. It will help um, flush out um, osmolarity. Um, just give you a nice coating, comfort. But like I said, and I added the April study slide two days ago. You've got to be telling your patients, right? You've got to you've got to use it for at least three months. You know, tell them three months apply. You go, this is how much you can calculate how much you need. So, ten mil bottle, one mil is about twenty drops. That's two hundred drops. Uh, you go four times a day, so that's oh, times that's like two, eight, fifty. So one bottle is going to last you a month. You know, so that's four bottles to get them through the four months that they're going to need to be on it, and then something a little bit uh, thicker at night time uh, just to get them through the night for the, for the people who are really struggling. So I return back to this slide and we come close to the end. We've mentioned education. I think I've gone through that hopefully well enough. Environment, we've spoken about diet, education, lubrication, lid hygiene, warm compressing. And that is stage one of the TFOS you to management staff. And I would be pretty surprised if there's anyone within the audience who um, who who couldn't get who's not at that level already. Even the students, um, and I, I don't mean that condescendingly, sorry, I apologize. You know, the students could do most of that now already. You're gonna learn the, the more complicated stuff and maybe some of the slip lamp techniques, but even at entry level optometry students. Uh, second, third years should be able to be at a level where they can do this uh, level of management. So we come to the end of uh, what I've got to say, and I, I think in summary, um, what, what you what you really want to remember is that you know what you have the tools, okay, and you have the skill set, so you can diagnose dry eye disease. This doesn't need um, this doesn't need to be referred. You know, you really are uh, the best place uh, to educate your patients um, and initiate treatment. You know so much more than your GP does. You are absolutely different gravy, okay? Your GP can't touch you, all right? And, and I say this with all honesty, you are possibly better than some ophthalmologists because, they, because at the moment not a lot of, not all ophthalmologists take this as seriously as they probably should okay and you've got to be you've got to keep up to date okay things are always changing um the 
when when I was doing some research a, a while back about binocular vision and um, dry eye, I, I reached out to some of the T uh, G two guys um, because I'm I'm lucky enough uh, to to be friendly with them, and 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 I've said to them, you know, what about um, binocular vision? And they were like, it actually didn't come up in in that first in that for in that thing of juice too it was something that actually wasn't really on their radar um so you've got to be keeping you've got, you've got to look around the subject as well i am gonna hit poll number six first if you don't mind david um because let's just get that done and then they, then we'll uh kind of get ready to roll up so i hope you found that interesting Will anyone be back for part two? Yeah. So that's great. Excellent. Um, for the two percent of you who are washing your hair, I hope that you get a really good clean. Because an hour and a half, you must have some seriously long hair. But I, I won't, I won't take it, won't take it personally. Um, we're gonna just move on from there. So let's click that one there, do that there. You can do it, guys. This is entry level management is not is not difficult. You can do it. You just got to pay attention. Um, uh, use the tools that you have um, effectively. Um, a little bit of uh, Tay Tay, he doesn't like Taylor Swift. Um, that is really all I have to say uh, for this moment. And a little bit of homework, you know, um, let's answer some questions. So, got some questions here. Um, question one, please, can you give some examples of all the creator goals? I can, yes. But if you come back in two weeks, I'll talk about them. Uh, but the, the big ones are pilot copy. Uh, all pilot copy is, is, is the one that we talk uh, that we uh, mentioned, and um, I'll talk about that in the, in two weeks. So I hope you don't feel offended that I haven't answered that. If you, if you really want to know now, reach out to me um, on uh, one of the social medias. I, I my emails at the end of this uh, presentation. Um, question two: Non-compliance of drops use is a big factor in my clinic. I think that the biggest thing with with non compliance of, of of any kind really is um, education. You really, really need um, you really need to, to educate your patient about why it is important to do it and why. And, and that's why I'm talking about expectations. You know. Um, You'll have your patient and they'll come to see you and you have a alcohol product that costs maybe three times more than the supermarket own branded um, hypermellows. And they're gonna wanna know why, will, why should I spend money on this product when I can go to wherever and get that product and it looks exactly the same. It, it's your job to educate them and say, well, firstly, piece of rubbish and you know generation one secondly this is a generation three product okay um it is getting better all the time non-stop you know but you have to use it even it is not magic okay um your diabetes doesn't get better if you take your diabetes tablet once it is ongoing um and the more we learn about it the more we know um that it um the, the more we know, the more we know it's long term, uh, and it, like I said, it's quite debilitating. So you have to take the time. So when you when you go and, and in lecture three, uh, where I talk about dry eye clinic, um, you're going to have to. I'm going to change that slide because it's distracting me. Um, you're going to have to think about how 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 much time you give to these to these people. Okay. Are saunas dry dry heat bad? You know what I don't. Steam rooms are better. Um, if you have evaporative dry eye, if you're in a sauna, you're just going to dry out while you're in there. I mean, long term, no. Short term, not great. 
Um, so go in the steam room, it, it, it's better for you. Um, is dry eye linked to adrenal glands? It can be, but then we're talking about systemic conditions, uh, which is a bit beyond uh, the scope of this. But it's, it's why um, when we were talking about questions earlier, um, you want to be talking about dry mouth. Um, you you, you want to go into actually more detail than that. Uh, you want to be talking about um, other mucous membranes within the body. And if, if you're in that level of, if, if they're in that level of um, pain, discomfort, if they reach that, that level, excuse me, then they, you, you need to be con, con consulting with their uh, general practitioner as well. Does heat radiation cause cataract? Um, I have not seen anything that makes me think that at this level of heat that we're doing, that it would have significant impact uh, on cataract progression. Um, uh, the, there is the original heat bag that you guys may have all heard of uh, by an ophthalmologist um, up north. Um, you know, he's an ophthalmologist and he did serious research into this, and lots and lots of people are bringing out heat bags um, now. So I would not um, think about, I don't think that um, it's enough of an issue where people can do it. No one wants to get sued uh, for giving them. Um, Granny, granny cataract. Um, so I, I wouldn't worry about um, heat radiation. Epithelial erosion, those are mine. What would you recommend? So epithelial erosions can be tough. Um, obviously, you've got to go three months of heavy lubrication. Um, you can also, our, our American colleagues like throwing doxy, uh, at 50 milligrams of doxy uh, twice a day uh, for a couple of months. Uh, seems to affect the MMP lines and, and the way you get healing. Um, but again, that really out of scope of this lecture. But it, the, the basic one at this level is heavy lubrication, heavy, heavy lubrication, ointment at night, and possibly something thicker during the day. A 0.4 um, hyaluronic is not going to really blur you, but it's going to give you better retention and uh, that longer contact time, a bit more comfort. And last question, I think, David, uh, do you do you eye local anesthetic when expressing lids um, and then you see the salmic drop post? No. I, I mean, you could use an anesthetic, you're probably going to help the blink reflex, but it's not, it's not significant. I mean, some of these guys, you have to really squeeze. I mean, you're really putting, putting effort in. And local anesthetic is not really going to, I don't think it's going to do much, so I don't. Uh, do I give a um, few dithalmic uh, cover? No, because it's really hard to get few dithalmic. It's like outrageously expensive. Um, and if you've done a reasonable job, you shouldn't have damaged them, in all honesty. So no, um, we don't, don't go down, um, don't go down that. Um, so that is it, I believe, from what I can see. Um, that is it, part one's done. Um, David is saying that he is going to send links tomorrow uh, via the email uh, for everyone to sign up to part two, for, um, for the 98% of you. For Malvi, who was cheeky enough to send me a message and tell me that she's washing her hair, surprised you got time to wash it out, Malvi, with the kids and all the other stuff going on. But um, hopefully we'll see you guys in uh, two weeks. Um, and we're just going to go a bit more. We're going to work our way through the rest of that um, management um, tree, management tier uh, that we created. Um, that is me. There are my details. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you need to, um, if you have any questions that you, that you, that you weren't able to uh, ask now. Um, I cheekily little um, uh, promo for my website. Uh, which is for people who like doing or are interested in prescribing, not necessarily prescribers. Uh, there's cases and stuff in there. If you have questions, feel free to sign up. Obviously, I need to thank Altacall for asking me to be here. So I'd like to thank David. I'd like to thank Jane for thinking I could do a reasonable job of this. I hope I have. And there you go. That's Altacall. They're the guys who put on this show.
and they have some fantastic products. Uh, you know, the least you can do is check them out. And that is it. We are done, Mike Thank you very much, Kaya. Much appreciated. And uh, yeah, as discussed, everything will be uh, sent out via email tomorrow with regards to sign up for two and three. And we look forward to uh, seeing you and uh, answering your questions and going through the uh, through stage two and three, stage three uh, in two weeks' time. Thanks very much, guys. Take care. Have a good evening. Bye, everyone. Take care.